Kia ora and welcome to Comfort.ai, making artificial intelligence your comfort zone. In this episode of Ethics Talks, we have an amazing guest, Dr. Chris Matman, who is the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at JPL NASA. I am so excited to have you, Chris. I have so many questions. Thank you so much for being a guest. Saba, thanks for having me. And it's uh, likewise a pleasure to be here. Awesome, awesome. So um, I would say let's start at the very beginning. Tell us a little bit, a bit about yourself, um, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and also I know you've done a lot of work outside of um, JPL, so I would love to, to know more about that as well. Sure, yeah. So I've been at JPL for about 20 years. Um, I am the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer there. I, I lead... Um, an innovation division that has multiple teams in it. Uh, it's one of the areas is the cloud practice at JPL, helping to deploy cloud computing for missions and science and so on. Um, I have a team of about 27 data scientists. Uh, these are people that are doing AI, machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, data visualization, things like that. And then I have a team that's focused on augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, does a lot of work with the HoloLens, uh, Oculus Quest 2, and things like that. And uh, a couple of the areas that we're working in are the future work, envisioning how work changes. Um, we are working with the People on Mars program that are developing uh, next generation rovers and autonomy for them, both for Mars 2020 and then future missions like sample return. And we also support the other lines of business and IT supporting automation, robotic process automation, and and other things. And um, had really kind of two careers at JPL. My first decade there, I was the chief architect and instrument and science data systems. So spent a lot of time working with remote sensing uh, of the earth and also planetary missions. And um, the last decade I spent in technology program development um, and then moving over to IT about five years ago as the deputy CTO and now the CTIO. Wow, is there anything you don't do? <laughs> I think should be my next question. That's amazing. That's so cool. So um, I would like to, my next question uh, for us to discuss a little bit about artificial intelligence. So um, having been in the field, I know that different people have different definitions of AI. Uh, how would you define, how would you define it? So for me, AI is the process of basically looking at the world, observing different processes that happen in it, trying to build a model of those processes and taking those processes and trying to make predictions that fit that model. So uh, measuring the bias associated with those predictions, you know, evaluating the confidence in that, developing better models and better training data and training data sets that you know we build models from uh, and refining all of the elements along the way in that process. Wow, that's awesome. So that leads me to my next question. One of the things I always hear from people um, is that we're doing AI and ML, uh, we're doing AI but we wanna do ML. Um, so how would you differentiate between artificial intelligence and machine learning? I think I think it's more of like a, a classical, you know, differentiation. Twenty five years ago, when I was, you know, in school and, um, you know, in the early part of my undergrad, I took a class in AI. And at the time, this was before, you know, they had widely available, you know, cloud computing, commodity computing, and things like that. And we just didn't have the computing power to do things that you could do today. So you know, deep learning was not, um, you know, unheard of. In fact, you know, neural networks had been developed by then. People talked about it. We just didn't have computers that you could easily run that stuff on. And so when I took a class on AI, it was all about propositional logic, expert systems. And again, like if you boil it down, it was trying to represent truth, truth values, logic, you know, and again, boiling down, making predictions, you know, about things and trying to evaluate it. Um, machine learning today uh, largely isn't necessarily the study of like, you know, 
classic AI in the sense of like building associative generative intelligence, you know, your classic AGI or expert system. It's more focused, I would say, machine learning in some cases on automation, on, you know, supervised learning. So, you know, giving feedback, you know, in a system about training and how well your predictions are, unsupervised learning, which is grouping things, um, looking at different, you know, data and then looking at the natural ways that you kind of break them apart. And really, you know, classically today, um, when people talk about things like deep neural networks or neural networks, a lot of times they're talking about machine learning because again, this isn't doing necessarily things like feature engineering or understanding the features and what you're trying to model. It's literally looking at and being inspired by our bodies, biological models like our visual cortex or our auditory systems in which we're just replicating life, you know, and those models in the ways that they are the real big thing about it is they're data driven. The more data that you give these models nowadays, the more that they learn. And then the more you have to do work you have to do to explain what they learned, you know, again, because we didn't start out with things like features. So a lot of times today, the last sort of few minutes of, of talk, that's what people are talking about machine learning. Uh, in the past, they were talking about expert systems, associative generative intelligence, those types of things. And that's how I would delineate the two. Wow. That's amazing. You've got so many great points. So um, just for our audience and or anyone who's listening, um, Chris has mentioned a few uh, concepts here like expert systems, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, neural networks, deep neural networks. I'll make sure to include videos and um, other resources for anyone who wants to know more about what these things are. Um, but I would like to now focus on uh, something very interesting you said, which I also, you know, believe in, which is, you know, with AI, we are basically replicating life. Um, and I always say, like, artificial intelligence is just a replication of natural intelligence. So we take what's in the brain, we implement it in the machines, um, which basically takes me to, to what this uh, whole, you know, episode and, and interviews are about, which is the ethical aspect of it. Um, and before I ask you a question about, you know, uh, you know, the ethical aspect of AI and machine learning, I want to know what your definition of ethics is in general. Yeah, so, I mean, just in general, a good part of ethics is do no harm. You know, that's, um, you know, or, or try and do, you know, in reverse, you could say, try and do the right thing, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, and, and so that, you know, is sort of my core definition of ethics. And I think that that translates very nicely to AI, um, you know, because you want to tell the machine, uh, you know, to do no harm or mm -hmm. to do the right thing, you know, and, and things like that in which the right thing or no harm are something that we can measure, uh, right, you know, in different ways. So that's cool. So then applying that same definition um, to the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do you kind of incorporate that into the decisions that you make, whether it's at JPL or the books that you, you write or the things that you do outside? How does it um, practically kind of uh, play a role um, in day-to-day yeah, so if you if you think about, you know, the AI or the, you know, I'm just going to use, I'm going to interchangeably use AI and machine learning, even though I delineated them before. But, you know, uh, if you think about the different steps of, you know, AI, it's looking at and observing the world. It's um, trying to build a model of that. It's making predictions and evaluating and testing your model. So when you observe the world, sometimes we observe the world in a biased way. Uh, you know, in, in if I'm trying to build a self-driving car and I never showed the self-driving car what someone in a wheelchair looked like, implicitly, I'm creating bias, um, you know, because the car does not know what to do. If I've never shown it a person of color uh, mm -hmm. and it's a computer vision problem, my training data set of observations is biased. So there is bias in everything. As humans, we all have bias, um, you know, in these types of things. But what we typically do is we try and minimize that if we're being, quote, ethical. You know, and again, we're trying not to do any harm because we need to handle and represent different groups. So 
in the training data set process or collecting our observations, having a balanced data set that isn't biased is helpful in all sorts of problems, you know, from computer vision to auditory problems and listening. So think about the way that you build your training data set and that you collect data. Then when you build the model and you make predictions, um, a lot of times you hear about predictions nowadays is here's the prediction. OK, well, what's your confidence in that prediction? Oh, you didn't tell me that. OK, well, was this really just the best decision amongst a set of terrible choices? You know, they're all very low confidence, very low rating, but I just gave you the highest one. Like if your highest confidence, you know, prediction is only 5% and your others are 1% or 2% and they're all equal, then you're not very confident in what you're predicting. And inherently there's bias. But we do this all the time in news media, in journalism, in science and things like that. We give a prediction, but we don't talk about the confidence, you know, behind it and things like that. So in predictions, you know, after you've done your training data set and building it or constructed a model, when you make predictions, you want to look to, again, do no harm or, you know, to do the right thing. And one of the ways you could do that is to provide the confidence in your predictions that you make that are associated with that. So for me, you know, AI is sort of a part of all of these different steps uh, mm -hmm. of just the process. I'm sorry, being ethical in AI is a part of all of these different steps that are part of the process of that. And then there's this sort of just ecosystem, you know, on the outside of, of considerations that are important as we automate things or deploy AI at wide scale. So the thing I'll say that is that, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about, and I'll just talk again about smart cars and smart trucks. Here in the US in the next five years, it's a big possibility that there could be trucking could be automated. You know, trucking mm -hmm. is a what they call a a um, you know, a high wage, you know, low skill, and it's not low skill, but it's just a classification job. In other words, you don't need an advanced degree to say do it, but there's so much subject matter expertise in it. However, since it's a high paying job, companies and industries are looking to automate them away. Well, if automating um, you know, smart vehicles and smart trucks ends up costing millions of truckers high paying jobs. That's not a good thing, social mm -hmm. or economically. And so, you know, we talk about that or we consider the ethics of AI as its implications on both the social fabric, the skill fabric, reskilling people as these things are happening. And there are all sorts of considerations like that. And the answer isn't, you know, learning to code. <laughs> It's really, I think that the answer for the, you know, some of these jobs that are getting automated away ethically is to turn those people who, you know, whose elements of their job are getting automated away, turn them into subject matter experts from which you could glean, you know, really input related to that. Mm. So upskill and reskill anyone who's impacted by it. that's that's good. That is a very interesting aspect. Um, one thing you you mentioned was um, the data. So the the data that's fed to a model is quite important. You know, if you don't have enough diversity in the data, then you kind of make your model biased. And we have seen examples of that. You know, um, things that have gone wrong. You know, over the history, uh, multiple times. That's the interesting thing. Um, as someone who um, has just started an AI startup, uh, one of the most difficult things is to get a hold of good quality data. Um, now I have two questions, basically. Um, one is, how would you, or do you have an example of a project that you've worked on that that process of data collection was really good and you really liked it and there were like good lessons learned? Um, and uh, the other question is, uh, a lot of people are struggling with quantifying basically what that good quality means. Uh, a lot of people talk about it, they say we want good quality data, but no one can actually say what that means. So do you have any definition for that? Sorry, that's two question in one. Yeah, no, and I'll try and, I'll try and answer both questions uh, sort of in my single answer um, you know, here. So, uh, I will give you sort of a use case. So JPL, um, the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, where I work, one of the big things that they're looking at in the future and that NASA is looking at is today, um, our rovers that are on other planets like Mars, they um, they do not have, say, the high power GPU-like computing processors that are necessary to do AI um, in them. 
there's, you know, not very many. In fact, one of the the most recent and and possibly only examples is the Ingenuity helicopter that went along with the 2020 Perseverance rover. It has a Qualcomm Snapdragon in it, which is an AI processor, but most of them don't. They have basically the equivalent of an iPhone 1 processor in them. Basically what that has to do with is cosmic radiation. When we put hardware into space, uh, cos the cosmic rays irradiate it and they can mess with the hardware. They can change ones to zero, zeros to one. Because of that, that puts us sort of on the technology downtick for including those capabilities. And we tend to include older processors that we know are resilient to that, which makes it hard to do what you can do on your desktop today. However, in the future, that'll change. We'll have more of the Ingenuity helicopter type situations and we'll have things like high performance space flight computing. Now, when we do, we can do imagine all sorts of you know different things. Like for instance, one of the things that we can imagine about that is having a rover on Mars basically look at the scenery and instead of you know sending back a couple of hundred images a day across the deep space network, which is our um, three dishes in Madrid, Spain, Canberra, Australia, and Goldstone, California, 70 meters, about football stadium in size. That's how we do all the deep space communication. Well, um, it's using radio frequencies, so it's not a big fat pipe, it's a thin pipe. And so because of that, we only send back about 200 images a day to decide what to do the next day, given those processor limitations on the rovers. Well, in the future, imagine a scenario that we could run machine learning or deep learning on the rovers, and instead of sending back 200 images a day, what if I could send back, I could run an image captioning model and send back a million image captions. I could give you a lot more, text is cheaper than images to send across that very thin pipe. And if you believed the captions that were coming back and they were scientifically meaningful, then it would give you a lot of value. Um, and so related to that, we've spent, we've done a research project at JPL that's just completed over three years in which we did exactly that. We built an algorithm that we call drive by science and the concept behind it is to take an, an image captioning algorithm like Google Show and Tell and to run it on the images. Now, to do that, we had to collect a training data set. We collected 6,800 images that were from other Mars rover missions, Mars Science Laboratory, not the 2020 Perseverance rover, but just other Mars missions and their navigation cams. One of the biggest things about that that we had to do is we had to validate that data set. We had to basically employ and pay a couple of postdocs uh, and eventually uh, planetary scientists to basically label, train these images uh, and, and put the captions on there so that the algorithm could learn that. Now, doing that, you know, was that easy? So there's a lot of talk nowadays that there's human-oriented ways of building these tra training data sets and you need high-skilled PhD people, especially in the sciences, to do that, um, Saba. So unless you're you know, labeling cat videos, you gotta, which, you know, anyone can do, you could do on Mechanical Turk or pay people across the world a very low amount of money to do that. You're talking in the cents per label. Arguably, mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, the dollar to five dollar per label, you know, where you need a PhD to do it, like that scenario that I just talked about in building up the training data set. So related to your question, there's a lot of work today, and it really relates back to ethics, in generative models. Can we, you know, basically um, build a generator, you know, that could generate believable labels, just like you, you see this face doesn't exist or this person does not exist. You train it on a computer vision model and it emits new faces. You know, you train on millions of celebrities and it emits faces that don't exist. The concept behind that is called generative adversarial networks. Well, that has all sorts of implications in this type of scenario where we could generate other Mars captions, other images and things like that, where you wouldn't necessarily have to employ, uh, you know, again, like multiple postdocs, high skilled people to do it. But then again, that gets back to skill, skill transitions. Are they the right labels? Are they valid? You know, is that the right way to do it? Even, and it's again, it's automating the training data set collection. So that's sort of my answer. I, I didn't really answer, but I gave you one example of the different considerations in a real scenario. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, again, uh, generative models, I'll make sure to include a link uh, for anyone in the audience. I have heard about them. It was one of the things that we came up with when we were uh, discussing about data collection, which is, you know, synthetically basically create data by giving it, you know, a set of uh, parameters to, to replicate. But then again, we asked that question is how accurate is it? You know, is, is it an accurate, you know, diverse, uh, representation of what's out there in the real world. So 
Um, yeah, very, very interesting problem. Um, uh, other question I want to ask is when it comes to ethics and space, um, how does how do how do these two kind of play together? Where does ethics fit into any kind of space related program? I'll kind of keep it at a high level um, there. I mean, so first, you know, there, there's many areas like, you know, you could talk national defense. So, you know, today space is, you know, a new element of defense. Uh, you know, you heard a lot of, I think, jeering about in the U.S. things like Space Force. But the reality is there have been, you know, things happening, you know, in space by, you know, many nations and space superiority is is something that all of them are focused on at some level. And so as things are automated and there is sort of space defense, not just space exploration, that's one way. Um, another way, you know, so ethics has to factor into, you know, engagement practices. It has to factor, you know, into uh, observation practices. Now, you hear a lot of talk about space transportation, uh, you know, and what are the ethics of that, you know, because again, there are just physical human body limitations, which is why mm -hmm. astronaut programs you know, try to sort of self-select people with particular physical traits or skills, which again, also had bias, you know, in doing that. But, you know, now you're going to send any tourist up there that has, I mean, not any tourist, you know, today it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the reality is in 10 to 15 years, it might not. It might cost the cost of a, and maybe it'll happen faster than 10 years. Some people predict in five years, it might be a business class ticket, you know, like, like for an airplane. And if it gets down to that level, Space tourism is something we're going to have to ask some ethical questions kind of related to that, too. Uh, another area is minerals, resources, things like mining, asteroid mining, um, mining on the moon. Uh, you know, yes, there are commercial interests in that. Yes, uh, that is happening. Uh, no, there's something called, you know, the International Space you know, Treaty. But, you know, how much legally does that, you know, apply to different countries and their ability to do things like that? That's another area. Um, there are people, you know, so you talk about manned exploration of places like Mars and, you know, all of the supply chain necessary at the moon and in lunar orbit L2, you know, which is the, you know, dark side of the moon, you know, to establish bases to do launching to get, you know, uh, human beings to Mars. There are all sorts of ethical questions about that. Those are likely one way trips, potentially, you know, uh, you know, to colonize or establish, you know, uh, again, you know, human presence on these planets. So there are all sorts of ethical questions about that. You know, is that correct? Or what types of people do you send there? How do you ensure you're not? So, you know, that's space exploration, you know, related. And then, you know, on top of all of these things, uh, there's also, you know, Earth-based questions, uh, you know, because Earth is a planet, but related to space. Take things like providing high-speed internet, like Elon is doing with Starlink, you know, what are the ethical questions around that? Because what that has sort of introduced is really space traffic management, <laughs> you know, because those Starlink satellites, which are commercial, you don't want them to get in the way of research satellites. And space traffic management was hard enough before, but with, you know, thousands of new satellites, both from things like Starlink and or CubeSat, small sats, where universities produce these, you know, sneaker box size satellites and get them up into space. Again, space traffic management, space junk, what we leave as a human race in space and how we, you know, handle those things all become very important issues. I think that's a decent treatment of the domain. So, so. Yeah, that's, and so much to think about. I mean, space has been one of the things that has always fascinated me. And it, it's the, it's the very reason why I ended up in AI story for another day in time. But, um, uh, I just, if it's ethical, I'm just going to put it out there because I don't know a lot, a, a lot about the um, ethical implications. But if it is ethical, I just hope it happens in my uh, lifetime because um, that would be one, you know, well spent business class um, ticket that I would definitely want to want to spend. Um, so that's amazing. We, we, there are so many questions and so many avenues that I just want to kind of dive in and ask. Uh, but we do have a limited time. Uh, so my next question is, are there any projects out there, any AI projects out there that concern you, uh, that you're concerned about the ethical aspects of it? Well, I think, you know, recently, uh, you know, maybe you read or, or maybe folks read in the New York Times about weapon systems that, you know, there was a, purportedly a weapon system that, um, you know, assassinated a uh, 
a scientist, uh, you know, and uh, I think he was an Iranian scientist or an Iranian, you know, maybe it's argued he's a member of the military in Iran. I don't know. And and supposedly, you know, Israel has some technology that was doing that or, you know, according to this New York Times story, what, whoever the players are and exactly whatever happened, the real implication bubbling it up to like the 50,000 foot level, you know, for me is, you know, anytime you automate uh, you know, potential things that could have have loss of life, you know, or kill people, basically. I mean, that's, you know, and, and you know, that has to be taken with extremely grave, you know, and very, very high standards and or to even be asked whether, you know, that should be done, uh, you know, related to that. And they're all and, you know, sadly, but it's true. It is a, you know, war is a business. And there are lots of businesses that you can ask, are these processes and business processes that we would like AI to be deciding in an automated way. Um, and I'm not even talking about without human review because we don't know there might have been human review there, but is it something regardless that you want to automate or do things like that? So those types of things concern me, uh, you know, potentially if true, you know, and uh, if those stories bear out. Um, and also the other things that concern me are, um, uh, like I talked about, the the not just the kind of callous or I think very shallow answer about the re very real reskilling problems when we use AI and really, you know, uh, transition uh, business processes, you know, and we automate people's jobs, you know, away. What do we do with those skills? How do we ensure that there's a there's a nice soft landing in which we give them very, very, you know, important things to continue doing and not give them a cliff? So. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. It, this um, automated weapon, um, automated weapons seems to be a, a common theme uh, that keeps coming through every time I ask someone this question. And then, of course, the, the reskilling is quite important, too. Um, my last question, have I asked you anything? Have I not asked you anything that you wanted me to ask you? Uh, I not, I mean, you haven't asked anything about Los Angeles or LA. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but I mean, no, it's, uh, no, I think, I think those are all, those are great things that we covered probably for your audience. So I think, um, you know, hopefully that's, you know, interesting and to the topic of the, of the show with them. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. I hope, um, everyone else who is watching the videos does as well. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, for um, anyone in the audience, again, I will put uh, links into uh, a lot of things that we discussed as well as the links to a couple of books that Chris has uh, written as well. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chris, for uh, being a guest. And yeah, let us know if you have any questions for me or, your, or for Chris. I'll make sure to uh, answer them the best that I can, and remember, technology can be fun, fashionable, and fabulous. <laughs>